Hallelujah. Turn to somebody, just give them a big smile and say, nice to see you in the house of the Lord. Let's just, let's just pray. Lift your hands up. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we thank you for another opportunity to share your word. And I pray, Lord, that you'll breathe upon the word of God by your spirit. Father, that you would give us manna from heaven. Teach us, Lord, lead us, guide us. I pray, God, give us a receptive heart to receive the engrafted word of God in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said a mighty <clears throat> amen and amen. I will, I will. I will. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Praise God. Now, I asked them especially because they had a program all laid out, but I said to them, listen, <clears throat> we've got to share the Word of God. And I said to them, if you they could just let me um, share God's Word with you first, and then they can do whatever they want to do. And um, I want to say thank you. I want to say that a lot of people are sharing their birthdays with me. Today is Prasanti's birthday. Uh, this morning also so happy birthday to Prasanti and then the following people are all made babies is Nicholas um, Nick Mothilal Hilton Glenda Wade Muzi uh, Bongi Brendan uh, Clinton Filet where's Clinton is he here Clinton yeah and 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 what my family interrupts me all the time Let's see what I have to put up with. I was coming to that. They're in the bottom of the list. So after Prasanti is Cynthia and Ashana. Amen. So Sister Cynthia, would you please stand up? And Ashana, happy birthday to you guys. And all of the names I mentioned. Hallelujah. <laughs> praise God. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Now, I, I want to share with you uh, quickly, um, uh, and, and of course to say, Pastor Ricardo, uh, for you and your people, uh, we just love you. Thank you for making the effort. And they, they left at 2 a.m. this morning to travel all the way from Newcastle just to come here and be with us this morning. So the, may the Lord bless you for that, and I really appreciate you coming. I, um, how many of you got your chronicles? You got your chronicles this month. How many of you don't have your chronicles this month? You didn't get it? Let me see your hand. All right. I trust you would get it because... You know, um, it's important for you to read it and for you to follow in with us. That's the culture of our church. Amen. And I was reading the Faith Chronicle the other day on Sunday, the 3rd of May. And the title of that message was uh, Jesus, the head of the body. And there was a beautiful, beautiful scripture. Uh, if I can ask one of the people to help me, please, I, Africa, I need my board out here. If you could help me with that. And if you got your chronicle, you could turn to the 3rd of May. And the scripture reading is from Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible says, and he is the head. Now, I would trust, please, for you to just kind of follow me um, uh, really closely and attentively. I, I would not be longer than 25 minutes. So it's a powerful word that I'm going to share with you. And if you grasp and catch this word, it will change your life, all right? So I want to take that as my scripture reference here from the, the, the reading on the 3rd of May because I kind of meditated on that and then I just expanded and thought about a few things. And if I would read to you then Colossians chapter 1 verse number 18. If you found it, say amen. And I want to talk about the pre... I know that some of you might not be able to see it, but some of you may... But really, that's what I want to talk about, is the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I want to talk about, the preeminence of Christ. I get that word from the scripture here that says, he, he, he is the head of the body, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in all things he might have preeminence. So if you've got your chronicles, you can underline that word preeminence. If you have your Bible, you can underline or circle that word. Or if you're taking notes, you can record that word. Now, I want to read, first of all, the devotional to you, and then I'll try to expand on that. The Bible, or the devotional rather, says here, the firstborn among many brethren. And the Bible says in Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 29, it says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. 
to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And verse number 29 says, the first begotten of the dead and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness. And I've gone on to Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. It says, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings on the earth. So here, the scripture is declaring that Jesus is the prince of the kings. And it doesn't say the kings in heaven, but it says kings on earth. So here the scripture refers to you as kings. Now you might not have a heavenly throne, but that's what the Lord says about you. You're a king. Amen. It says, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us. I, like, I, I just simply love that because, see, some of us came from a religion that, where we never felt the love of God. We yearned for the love of God, but we did not feel and experience the love of God. Are you with me? We, we, we longed for that love. We yearned for that love. But all we got was a dose of religion. Well, we didn't feel the love of God. But the Bible says here, unto him that loved us. That means here, once and for all, understand Jesus loves you. Why well, would you turn to someone and say, Jesus loves you? Now, now, now that's amazing. It's so simple. It's, it's kind of like, you know, it's like everybody should understand this, but you know, when people are going through different things in their lives, they kind of they kind of question that. They kind of think, well, does Jesus really love me? Does God really love me? Yes, He does. But your circumstances have got nothing to do about the love of God that He has given you. Now, the Bible says, unto Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Say amen to that. So you are not only loved by God, you have been forgiven your sins and washed by his blood. Now, watch this now. Jesus was born again and he became the door. The fleshly birth was a legal entry to the earth, but because Jesus is the head of the church and the firstborn from among the dead, he became the door. See, Jesus became the door. Now, this is very important for you to understand that, that Christ became the door and why I'm saying that is that if you understand these things here, it will just give so much oomph to your faith. Amen. That means when you're going through trials and battles and when you, you know, contending with different things um, in life, in circumstances of life, just understanding this here will give you so much of fuel to your enthusiasm. Are you with me? It says here that he became the door or the legal entry into the kingdom of God. That means to get into the kingdom of God here, to get into the kingdom of God, you've got to go through Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says there's no other way but through Jesus Christ. Say amen. Now, many of the modern, uh, modern day religions teach that there are many ways, etc., etc., but not so with the Bible. The Bible says Jesus emphatically said the statement, and I don't think he was being arrogant. He just kind of was just very bold, and he stated the fact. He says, I am the only way. He says, no one cometh to the Father but through me, pertaining to Jesus, or meaning Jesus. Are you with me? So he says here, the fleshly birth is the legal entry into the earth, but because Jesus is the head of the church, the firstborn among the dead, or from the dead, he became a door or the legal entry into the kingdom of God. That means that when we accepted Jesus Christ, we stepped into the kingdom. Oh, come on now. I want someone to help me. When you accepted Jesus Christ, you stepped into the kingdom of God. So, so your whole life has changed dramatically. That means you're in a place, another place called the kingdom of God. And you function by different rules there. Are you with me? But it's a better place to be because God is in control. And I, that's why I want to bring you back to that word preeminence, and I'll define it in a minute just to give you an understanding of that. So there's no other way you, can, you can't get there by the church door being baptized. You can't get there by paying your tithes or being good. You must be born again. And Jesus is the door of that new birth, just as physical birth is the entry to the earth. 
The spiritual birth through Jesus Christ is the only legal entry into heaven. That means you can't get into heaven but by being born again. Are you with me? Now watch this. You are now in that way. God has filled you with complete. You can circle that word knowledge if you're following in your chronicle. That word knowledge. That's another important word and I'll kind of emphasize that in a minute. It says you are now in that way. And God has filled you with complete knowledge of his will. Jesus is Lord over you and the head of the body, the church, and all things. And I end up with that word, in all things he has preeminence. Say preeminence. Pre I want you to shout it out to me like you really mean it. Say preeminence. Pre all right. That means that in all things he, talking about who? Talking about Jesus Christ, has preeminence. Are you with me? So I'm using as my foundational text then Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 where Jesus Christ is not only spoken to of Lord and Savior but he's spoken of as having preeminence. Now when I got hold of that word reading the chronicle you know I, when, when we wrote it it was just written without an in-depth study but when I got a hold of that word preeminence I said well Lord what what does it mean and why do you want us to know that you have preeminence? The other logical question that came up in my mind was that if you have preeminence, how does that affect me? How, 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 many, how many of you think that that's a good question to ask? If, if I know that Jesus has preeminence, how does that affect me on this earth? Well, it has a lot to do with you on this earth. Because if you understand that he has preeminence, then you will have boldness in your faith. Amen. Are you with me? So Colossians chapter 1 verse 18, that's, that's the scripture, that's the foundational text I want to give you here, is, um, uh, yeah, is he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, in all things that he might have preeminence. Now in the Amplified Bible, I'd like to read to you the same scripture, and it goes like this. He also is the head of his body, the church, talking about Jesus Christ. He is the head, the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that he alone in everything and in every respect might occupy, I like this, this is found in the Amplified Bible, it says that he might occupy the chief place. Now, 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 I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that because, look, the thing is, in this world today, there are so many religions there's so many deities. There's so many beliefs. Even atheists believe in something. Atheists believe in nothing. Are you with me? But in the whirlpool of conflict, the Bible is telling us here as Christians that Jesus holds the chief place. I like that. Now, I, I don't want to argue with them out there who differ with me. I, I, I'm not attacking them. I'm not being derogatory in any way. Listen, they are free to believe what they want to believe. But for me, I'm born again. I have an experience with God, like you. You've had an experience with God. Now, for me, according to the scriptures, the Bible says Jesus has the chief place. Now, let me just read that scripture in full. It says that he has the chief place and in brackets stand first and be preeminent. Again, that word pops up. What is that word? Preeminence or preeminent. Now, in order for you to understand and for me to understand what preeminent means, let me define that so that we can grasp it. Where did I pull that word out of? I pulled it out of Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. Now, watch this. Preeminence, actually, the original Greek is the word proteo, and we find another meaning that comes out of that called protos. Now, this is what it means. It means this. It means first in rank and influence. I like that. It doesn't say is among those that have rank and influence. Because if it used the word among, that means that Jesus is one of. But it says that it's first in rank and influence. So that means for, as a Christian, you've got to understand and believe that he has first rank. Amen. In other words, first place. Amen. All right? Are you with me? It says that 
Proctor's foremost in time, order, and importance. It's the first type or model of something. The first type or model of something. Now, think about this. Jesus the door into the kingdom of God, right? He's, he's, he's the son of God. He's gone on to heaven and created with God. Now, you were born in and through Jesus. Because you believed in Jesus Christ after hearing the preaching of the gospel, you became the first prototype. Now, I considered that for a minute, and I just thought, and I, I'm sure you, you're quite intelligent, and you'll understand what I'm saying. They don't, de don't design a car by default. Neither do they design a car by, just we think it's a nice thing. It's by design and by planning and by lots of work. They have engineers and craftsmen that plans the whole thing and they put it all together and they say, wow, this is our prototype. Out of the prototype comes that particular model that's manufactured and sent worldwide. In order for them, listen very carefully, in order for them to examine whether that production line lines up and fits to the standards of the manufacturer, they compare it to what? The prototype. And if it fails, it's rejected and fixed. Mm. Well, what is the prototype? The first original design. And we have in the church a first original design. Jesus, who is the door, and according to the Amplified Version of Colossians chapter 1 verse 18, He holds the chief place. So it also means the idea of being first, holding the number one position in the order of things. I like this, the dictionary, the Oxford Collins or the Oxford Dictionary defines it as follows. And I'll just share that with you quickly. It means choiceness. It means to be distinguished. Has distinction. And it also means to have excellence. First ratedness. Greatness. Perfection. This is talking about Jesus having preeminence. The quality of state of being preeminent or superior. I like that. Now, I then asked a question, because that's where I grabbed my study out of, that 3rd of May, on Colossians chapter 1.18. I said, Lord, why it is important, why is it important for me to understand your preeminence, and how will that influence my life? A very, very, very good question. We got to understand the preeminence of Christ on five spheres, if I may just share that. So, we're going to take five spheres. Different levels understand the preeminence of Christ. One, two, three, and number five. Now, after we understand the five levels that Jesus has preeminence, then we can see why it is important for us to understand it. All right? Now, let me give you the first point. The first point where Jesus has preeminence, and we must understand that so it has huge impact on our lives, is number one in universal government. So Jesus has preeminence in universal government. What do I mean by universal government? Can I write that down here quickly? Would you say that with me? Say universal government. Now you really don't mind because we are not having a, we're not having service on Wednesday because of voting, Right? And uh, so it doesn't matter if we go a little bit longer this morning. It's a special day, right? Amen. And you have, you're off on witness day. So while we're all here, let's make the best of it. Because I'm speaking to people that are hungry for the word of God. Amen. All right. So how does Jesus then have preeminence in universal government? Now let me share the following with you. Number one, he is... The visible image of God. Now understand why this is important. Simply because, look, all of us are dealing in a visible world. So we're dealing with people or things we can see, relate to, touch and feel. But the Bible tells us that He is the invisible God. 
in a visible world. That's why we need a demeasure of faith to walk in the things of God because we don't see anything. And sometimes when we do see, we have to ignore the natural. Because the natural can fail you or the natural has a limitation. For example, let's say a certain individual is sick and then you, you, you take the child to the doctor and you know, the doctor does his best and finally he tells you, look, he has an incurable disease and you know, there's nothing more we can do. So what do you have to switch to then? You have to switch to an invisible God that you're relating and that you're serving to to give you a visible manifestation. So you've got to understand His preeminence in the universal government. That He is number one, He is the visible of the image of God. For Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says this, and I'm going to give you four points under this here. I'm going to give you four points under the universal government, and these are the four points. Number one, he is the visible image of God. Colossians 1.15 says, Now he is the exact likeness of the unseen God, the visible representation of the invisible, for he is the firstborn of all creation. Now why is it important for you to understand that? It's simply this. Because he has a huge God that we serve, Right? But to us, he's invisible. But he's, he's real. Amen. And I got to know as a Christian that, hey, everything in this life, even in the world, is controlled by Christ Jesus. Why? Because he is preeminent in universal government. Number two, under that point, number two, he is the agent of creation. What well, the Bible says in Colossians 1.16 in the Amplified, it says, For it was in him that all things were created, in heaven and on earth, things seen and things not unseen, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things were created and exist through him by his service, intervention, and in and for him. That means he is the agent of creation. So in other words, he's preeminent in the universal government, number one, because of what? He is the visible image of God. Number two, the agent of creation. Number three, the sustainer of all things. Why am I saying he is the sustainer of all things? Because Colossians 1.17 in the Amplified says, For he himself existed before all things. Say amen, somebody. Christ existed before all things. Before you were born, He existed. Actually, if you look at yourself, you are a word from God. <laughs> Do you know that you're a word from God? See, your name, your identity, just you, yourself, you're a word from God. Amen. You were not born by mistake. Huh? Tell your neighbor, you're not a mistake. I mean, think about that. What are the chances of all the millions? And maybe I mustn't be too kind of descriptive in my analogy, but from, from, from everyone that could have been born at the time you were conceived, you, out of the whole race, won. Could have been something else, somebody else, and that, you know, but, but you were born. All right, so he's the sustainer of all things. And number four, the fourth point under that, he's the head of the church. For Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 in the Amplified says, he's also the head of his body, the church, seeing he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he alone in everything and in every respect might occupy the chief place, stand first and be preeminent. That means what God is saying to us is that he is Preeminent. Christ is preeminent. That's number one. And number two, now, now let's jerk your neighbor because some of you either are switching off or just tap them like that lightly and say, are you, are you with this thing? All right. So, so that means, listen, this is important for you to grasp. 
because he's the head of the church and he's the firstborn and God is saying he might occupy the chief place. In other words, he wants Christ to be preeminent in your life. Now, I don't know about you. It's a journey for all of us. We all start on a journey. We progress in that journey. Some of us stumble, make mistakes. We fall, we learn. But here's the issue that we all must strive for Jesus to be number one in our lives. Or I tell your neighbor, I'm striving, man. I'm striving, I'm pressing, I'm pressing, I'm pressing, I'm pressing. Are you with me? So we're all pressing so that Jesus may have first place. That he might occupy first place. Have chief place. Number two, not only is Jesus preeminent in the universal government, but number two, he is preeminent in what we would call a reconciliation. Reconciliation. Now that is important because... He reconciles us back to himself in his death. For in Colossians 1, 21 and 22, the Bible says in the Amplified that although you were at, talking about you, although you were at one time were strange and alienated from him and were of a hostile attitude of mind in your wicked activities, yet now has Christ the Messiah reconciled you to God. In the body of his flesh through death, in order to present you holy and faultless and irreproachable in his Father's presence. That means Christ has reconciled you back to God. That means you're connected back to God. You're not alienated from God. Say amen. amen. Irrespective of what you do. Now God will have to deal with you individually about that. He may deal with you in company about that. He may deal with you privately about that. But he'll set that. That doesn't mean to say you're separated from God. Your mistakes don't separate you from God. You're God's child, period. Can I hear a loud amen? amen. You're God's child, period. Amen. I mean, one of your children, their surname don't change because they become naughty. He still retains the same original surname. So you don't lose your identity because you do something wrong. You still maintain the original identity because Christ reconciles us by his death to himself. Number two, under that point, lives in us as the hope of our glory. That means Christ lives in us. And the scripture reference there, and I won't read it because of time, is Colossians 1.27. Now, the third thing that Christ has preeminence here, the third thing, is in wisdom and knowledge. In wisdom and knowledge. Now, isn't this amazing? That if Christ has preeminence in your life, you can draw from his wisdom and you can draw from his knowledge. See, the natural man has a limitation. He can only go as high or as far as natural things will take him. But not a child of God. A child of God goes higher than that. Because God can speak to you in dreams. And God can speak to you in visions. And God can speak, you, speak to you out of the word of God. God can give somebody else a word of knowledge or a dream or a word for you that can come and bring encouragement, correction to you. You understand that? So we have a wisdom and a knowledge far superior than that of the world. But Christ, you must understand who's behind that wisdom and knowledge is Christ. He has preeminence when it comes to that. Say amen to that. All right, to reference that I won't read to you this morning, but you can look at it, is Colossians 2, 20, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. He is the source of all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And of course, Worldly philosophy does not conform to him. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8. Now, I'd like to read that scripture to you. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8. Now, this is beautiful. Look at how nice it says it. It says, see to it that no one carries you off as a spoil. I was contemplating that word and I thought about the word abduction and kidnapping. When you kidnap somebody or abduct them, it's unlawful, number one. And number two, it's illegal. You take them against their will. And the Bible says here, see that no one carries you off as spoil. In other words, no one abducts you. No one kidnaps you. 
or makes you yourselves captive by so-called philosophy, intellectualism, and vain deceit, idle fancies and plain nonsense. Following human tradition, men's ideas of the material rather than the spiritual world. Now watch the comparison there. He's comparing the material world with the spiritual world. Hey, now listen, I've got nothing against the material world. I think God wants you to have things to enjoy life. Can I hear a loud amen? amen? But he doesn't want you to enjoy the material world and forget that there is a spiritual world behind the material world. Simply because if we forget that, we forget that the material came from the spiritual. Let me try that again one more time. Because if we forget that, we forget that the material comes from the spiritual. Because it's God's goodness that gives you. Try it one more time. God's goodness gives you what you have. And so progressively as we're walking in our Christian walk, we must not forget that. See, I am what I am, and you are what you are, but by the grace of God. That means today, as you sit here, for all the things you have, you must thank God. For all of the stuff God blessed you, you've got to be thankful to Him. You've got to understand that because of Christ having preeminence in wisdom and knowledge, He's transferred that to you when you were born again. So you operate in the Christ, Christ-given knowledge and wisdom. Say, Amen. Amen. So the Lord has not let you alone. Now, let me share the fourth one with you. In religious observance, Christ has preeminence, the fourth one, in religious observance. In other words, what do, what do I mean by that? It means this. It means we are alive in Him. That means I'm alive. My faculties have come alive because of Christ. You are alive because of Christ. I don't mean physical life. Because physical life is suke life. But I'm talking about zoe life. <laughs> the God kind of life. It's in you and in me because of Christ. So in our religious observance, in other words, when we come to church, when we partake of communion... We understand that this life, eternal life, Zoe life, comes from God. I'm thankful to my Creator. For the stuff that I do, I'm thankful to God. In my worship of God, when coming to church, coming to church should not be an issue simply because it's my religious observance. I come to God because I'm thankful to Him. Had it not been for Him, Are you with me, guys? When I bring my tithes, my offerings, when I come and serve God, I'm, I just do it in my religious observance because of my love for Him and His love for me and His transference of eternal life. It's the Zoe kind of life that God gave me. How do I repay Him? I repay Him in my religious observance. That's how I repay Him, that I'll praise Him and I'll worship Him. And the last one, the fifth one, that Christ has preeminence in the universal government, in reconciliation, in knowledge and wisdom, in my religious observant. And the last one is Christian living. Christian living. Very important, Christian living. So those are the five aspects. And why did I say Christian living? Because in Christian living, he is the source of our new life. Are you with me? And the, 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 the reference for that is in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 4. If you have been raised with Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And watch this now. It says, and I'm almost completed, it says, and set your mind, set your mind and keep them set <laughs> you must set your mind and keep it set on what is above very important guys 
We say, what am I talking? What's my subject? The preeminence of Christ. What's my foundation of Scripture? Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. It said that Christ may have preeminence. Now here, this Scripture is telling me to keep my mind set on what is above. And keep it set on what? That Christ has preeminence over universal government, over reconciliation, over wisdom and knowledge, over my religious observance, and over my Christian living. Now that means, if I can understand all of that, that Christ has preeminence. And when I'm talking about Christian living, I'm talking about everything. It's about your marriage, your home life, your work life, everything that you're dealing with. Just about every aspect of you, your Christian living, your serving God, all of that. Christ has preeminence. That means you cannot fail because he's in charge. But the point is now, you will fail if you don't keep your mind set. Let me illustrate by the word of God where, you know, Peter said to God, to Jesus, he said, listen, Lord, I'd like to walk on water. Uh, would you like me to walk? Uh, and he said, come, Peter. And Peter began to walk and he looked at Jesus and he began to walk. But as soon as he moved his eyes into the boisterous waters, what happened to him? He began to sink, right? Where should he have set his eyes? On Christ. So in other words, the Bible is saying to you, what, this is very interesting. It says, and set your minds and keep them set on what is above, the higher things, not on the things that are on the earth. Now, in brackets, the Amplified Bible says, set your mind on higher things. Now, if he says, set your minds on higher things, not on the earth, but what is in heaven, that means what he's automatically saying, which is not written there, but what he's automatically saying, that the things on the earth are lower things. In other words, keep your mind on higher things, that's in heaven. The higher thing, brothers and sisters, is that Christ is the door. Christ has preeminence over these five aspects, and I cannot sink as long as I keep my mind set. Now it says, for as the world is concerned, you have died. Now some of you are struggling why your family don't understand you, simply because you've died to the world, and you are alive in church. This is your new family here. Now I'm not saying that you should not have any fellowship with your family, but the point is, the family of God is your first and foremost family. All right? For as the world is concerned, you have died, and your new life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in splendor and his glory. Now, let me conclude this with the following scriptures. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 to 20. The Bible says, as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Now, we're still talking about the preeminence of Christ. Here the Bible tells us in Ephesians, Christ, God raised him from the dead and made him to sit at the right hand in heavenly places. But Ephesians 2 verse 6 tells us, because now here's the question that arises, how is it applicable to you? You're telling me, Pastor, all of this, that sounds great. If Christ has preeminence in all those four areas, how is that applicable to me? Well, this is where it's applicable. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 6. He raised us up together. With Him and made us to sit together. Giving us joint seating with Him. In the heavenly sphere, by virtue of our being in Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Now, God did this so that we can rule in life. And if you keep your mind set on the preeminence of Christ and that you seated with him, guess what? According to Romans 5 verse number 17 in the TEV translation, the Bible says, All who receive God's abundant grace are freely put right with him, will rule in life through Christ. So brothers and sisters, I have a word for you. You can't fail. Amen. And even if you do fail in certain areas, it's temporary, not permanent. Amen. So you are guaranteed to succeed. Amen. 
You're not seated with anyone else. You're seated with Christ in heavenly places. And Christ has not failed. He triumphed over death. The Bible says he became weak so that you can be strong. He became poor that you may become rich. I mean, you're going to be a success because simply he was successful. But I've got to keep my mind set where? On Christ because he has preeminence. Now, when you consider your natural circumstances, I was, I was sharing with the first service. And I'll just share this with you. And maybe it will make you laugh a little bit. But don't get offended with my analogy, all right? But one time, I was driving this morning to church, and on the side of the road, there was a VW Beetle. It had broken down, and the driver got out the car, and he was fiddling with the car. Now, it had blue bumpers, orange doors. I mean, every part of the car had a different color. I looked at the car, and I said, Pastor Zubeda, I said, we owned one of that. And I kind of went back in my memory lane to the time we had one of those cars, and I used to always warn Pastor Zubeda, be careful of the floorboard, because I had a gaping hole. We could see all the potholes. On a rainy day, we would put a plastic on there and put a mat so that the water wouldn't come through. And I used to always warn, I said, don't forget to rest. You, if you rest your leg on that mat, it will go right through and you'll have no leg. And I remember on sunny days, it was air conditioning. <laughs> it had a big hole, I promise you. It's a true, it's a true story. I bought the car from Hillcrest. And I bought it at night. I got advice for you. Never buy a car at night. <laughs> I never saw that hole in the floorboard until the next day. But I used to watch the white lines on the tarmac. But here's the issue, and this is why I'm sharing this with you. I said, you know, I used to own one of that. See, sometimes people don't know the story behind the story. And I think many of you can identify with that. But you know, progressively, when I came to the knowledge of Christ, and the knowledge of salvation, I began to understand the prosperity message. I first fought it. I did not understand it. I, my mind wrestled to grasp it. But when I caught it, brother, you know, no one could stop me. But I struggled. I really struggled with it. When pastors used to speak about prosperity, I used to reject that. Ah, oh, there he goes again. There he goes again. But you see, here's the issue. Having material possessions, you could still be poor and still have a lot of money in the bank. Do you understand? Because your bank account is not indicative of the fact that you are rich. Because I found rich people having a bankrupt mind. Simply because they have a poverty mentality. So God progressively takes you to the journey to change you. He, he took me through that journey. He said to me one day, he said, if you can trust me for a bigger car, uh, or a better car, I'd give you one. So I said, Lord. And he said to me, and I remember the Reader's Digest magazine. You remember the Reader's Digest magazine? How many? They had competitions running on those magazines. I cut off a picture of a BMW, and I pasted it on my car window. I won't tell you what car I had then. But anyway, as I was driving, I kept on saying, God, one day I'd own that. Lord, I call that into being. I put one next to my desk. Every time I would pray, I'd look at this, and i say, I call you forth in the name of Jesus. Three years later, I started to drive one. But it was second hand. And then I had a second hand mentality. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I'll tell you what. When, I, when we first got married, all my furniture was very class furniture. It was the best chipboard available. <laughs> my wife warned me. She said, don't buy this. This is junk. She says, if you buy this, it'll last for a year. She said, buy good quality furniture. I don't mind waiting. But... I had a poverty mentality. So what I would do, I'd watch the, 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 the veneer shine on it. I said, buy this. Twelve months later, glass of water falls, the whole drawer falls apart, chipboard, soaked. Why? I was responding with a poverty mentality. But thank God for it, as I meditated on the Word of God, I slowly but surely changed. And not long after that, I trusted God, and God said, trust me for a brand new car. And I said, okay, Lord, I'll trust you for a brand new car. And I remember the day I bought a brand new car. I loved the smell of the leather, and I drove out of the showroom on a brand new car, and that was history. That was many years back. But you see, that's not where I started from. 
And I've got news for you today. doesn't matter what level you are at, God's going to change that. I prophesy that over your life. And when God, I, I'm telling you this here, listen, I, I can share this with you openly. The way you serve me, the way you serve the church, the way you give your tithes, your offerings, the way you sow, this is the beginning of great things for you. Amen. Hallelujah. I said to you, that's the beginning of great things for you. It may look silly. It may not look, you know, kind of, it kind of looks kind of crazy to the natural eye. But we don't live, we're not natural people. We're spiritual people. Say amen to that. And I prophesy over everyone here today, this is the end of a poverty mentality. This is the end of second rate mentality. This is the end of what I would call chipboard mentality. It's over. Tell your neighbor, it's over, it's over, it's over, it's over. I prophesy over you multi millionaire status. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Yeah, I'm telling you, just stick with me. We're going somewhere. Yeah, don't get mad and, get, you know, don't let the devil walk you out of the destiny. Say amen. amen. Don't go to a church where you are comfortable because they'll put you to sleep and they'll bury you dead. Do you understand what I'm saying? We, you know, we, 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 we are a group, a community of faith people. There's a, there's a group of dreamers here. Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, that's a success story where you'll have nothing. Then all of a sudden, you're going to turn. I, I was having a dream about somebody in the church. I know the name, but I won't give you the name today. So I don't feel it's right for me to kind of release that word right now. But I had a dream about somebody. There was fighting and fighting and fighting. It was a lady in the church. And then I got up thinking, why, why am I dreaming about this lady fighting? And God said, she has just become a millionaire. So, so here's the point. You are wrestling with many things. You are fighting with many things. You're grappling with many things. But I tell you what, it's not a warfare that is futile. It is something that you are, because God's taking you on a journey. God's breaking thresholds for you and you are going forward. Say hallelujah. Can I just give you one passage of scripture, one more? Please remain standing, I'm done. The heaven... Of heavens is for God, but he puts us in charge. This is the message Bible of Psalm 115 verse 16. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth has he given to the children of men. The heaven of heavens is for God, but he put us in charge of the earth. He puts us in charge of the earth. Brothers and sisters, if you understand the preeminence of Christ, nothing can stop you. Tell your neighbor, nothing can stop you. Now, can I give you a blessing before I sit down and then I think I want to hand over to them just to do a few things. I want for all of you that have sown your tithes, your offerings, have given of your substance, your first fruits, all of you that have sown into my birthday, into the pledges, people that have given us, I want to bless you with a priestly blessing. Now, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord multiply you. May the Lord give you a thousandfold more than you've ever experienced in your life. Not only money, but lands, houses, vehicles, and things to enjoy. May the Lord give you the desires of your heart. May the Lord establish you and prosper you. May the Lord give you the wisdom and knowledge to break barriers in your life. May the Lord give you the mentality of more than a conqueror. May the Lord help you to break every limitation in your life. May every curse and hex ever spoken to you be broken and shattered in the name of Jesus. May the unemployed in our church be employed. May the people that are grappling with finances, may you flourish in the name of the Lord. May all of those people that are professional people... As you are functioning in your workplace, may you be promoted. May you overtake them. Even as the Bible says, the last shall become the first. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a great hand. Clap your hands to the Lord. Say, I receive it. Amen. I prophesy that over you. Now, don't take this lightly because I know what I'm carrying. All right. It doesn't matter what you think about me. I'm not here to appease you. Because of your opinion, it won't stop me preaching. Do you understand? 
Pastor Ricardo came in this morning. He said to me, Pastor, you know, there was a young lady you prophesied over at my church at the last crusade you were there. I said, yes. And uh, she was unemployed at the time. And Pastor Ricardo said to me, Pastor, she's been offered a job in China. And she's now flown to China for a job that they offered her just merely by prophecy. So I'm telling you, you're going to sing all the way to the bank. Yeah. Yeah. This is just the beginning. And I prophesy over our church 7,000 <laughs> people coming from the east, the west, the north, and the south. Prompt, diligent, dedicated people. They shall plant this place. There will come a day there'll be a traffic jam outside. And this building will not be able to contain us. Hallelujah. I believe it. Say amen. amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. This is the beginning of your success. Amen. It's the beginning of your story. Amen. Come on, give your neighbor a high five. Say, this is the beginning. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. Amen. Come, Pastor Wesley. Wes, Wes. Hallelujah. Clap your hands to the Lord. Give him praise. Amen. 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 How many of you believe that we are going to see people with millionaire status in this church? I told you, I remember one day I walked into church and I said, I gave you a word. I simply said, the day has begun. It has begun. That word has not fallen. It is now escalating and, you know, gathering momentum. Say hallelujah. So this is the beginning. I said, you're going to sing all the way to the bank. All right. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen.